engine. So, the 1820, um, if you can give us a rundown on um, why, why this engine went into the 17 and then some of the basics of how this works. This is an R1820 engine and 1820 is a uh, designation but also tells us that 18, 1820 cubic inches and this is really kind of a second generation air-cooled radial engine and there were some very important technologies that were developed uh, by the Air Force's labs in the 20s in terms of cooling that made air-cooled radial engines possible. Um, this structure here, these fins, are made out of aluminum, not mm -hmm. steel, and aluminum was much better at shedding heat. And then also we see the valves here, and there's a cutaway. That valve is hollow, but not only is it hollow, but in operation it would be filled with sodium, which helped with cooling. And that technology was also developed by the Air Force's lab at, at McCook Field in the 1920s. Um, by an engineer by the name of Sam Heron. So we have this first generation of air-cooled radials, uh, like the R790. This is kind of the next generation, the R1820. And, and this also represents, you know, the, the B-17 is seen as a World War II bomber, but it's not a product of World War II. The first B-17 flew in 1935, years before the U.S. entered the war. And we look at some other bombers that came along later, 1939, 1940, and so on. So the B-17 is really a product of the 1930s. Hmm. It's not a product of World War II, it was just developed. And so that's why it has this 1820 engine. In the mid-30s, this was state of the art. Mm. You know, World War II, we see double roll radials, you know, yeah. radials with 2,000 horsepower, even more. This has 1,200 horsepower. Now in the case of the Memphis Bell, this is a more advanced model mm. uh, of the uh, 1820. The, the B-17E had a Dash 65 model. This is the Dash 97. So it's a little more powerful. It had a war emergency rating. So between the additional horsepower of the a war emergency rating, which would be about 1,400, 1,500 horsepower. Um, normally this is 1,200 horsepower. With this additional power and the paddle bladed props, that's really what contributes the most to making the B-17F the fastest model of the B-17. Let's take a second to talk about uh, props. Um, so what can you tell us about, um, real briefly, uh, anything leading up to the significance of the prop and uh, its point in time in technology on the bell? Yes, so the in a broad sense, the props were variable pitch or constant speed propellers. Very important technology that was in part developed in the Air Force's labs mm -hmm. in the 20s and 30s. And what that means is the angle on the prop blades can turn to take advantage of the horsepower from the engine because basically propellers translate the horsepower of an engine mm -hmm. into thrust. And um, it's better to have certain angles at lower speeds and other angles at high speed. So, so they're variable pitch propellers. Now these propellers in particular are very important and uh, the B-17F model introduced them. So the earlier model, the B-17E, had narrower uh, propeller blades. When you say narrow, narrow it this way or narrow it? Uh, uh, Width-wise, okay. yep, so they were narrower this way. Yeah. Um, so th they're kind of nicknamed paddle-bladed props. Okay. But these, pro these props being wider did a much better job translating the horsepower of the engine into thrust. And inefficient propellers basically waste the horsepower of an engine. Hmm. So the B-17F introduced this style of propeller, wow. um, which uh, contributed to it in part to it being the fastest model of the B-17 at 325 miles per hour. Okay. Um, and then uh, for a lot of the nostalgia guys out there, uh, everyone uh, knows that Hamilton standard signature. Uh, you don't see that on the bell. Um, is there a reason, did it not have that on there? Did ham standard not make these or? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I'm, a little supposition on my part, um, I think that those decals were found kind of later in the war. Mm -hmm. um, we do know for sure 
that the Memphis Bell's props did not have those decals on them. Yeah. Um, also, too, some of those uh, propeller blades were replaced mm -hmm. over the course of the combat tour. What's kind of interesting on the Bell, if you look at the props on the Memphis Bell on the number one engine as it sits now, it has no, they have no stencils on them. And that cl shows up very clearly in the photos and in the outtake footage that for whatever reason, when they replaced those blades, those didn't have the stencils that describe the part number and angle and when they were inspected and so on. Mm -hmm. They just simply didn't. We don't know why, but we've just reproduced what was there uh, in evidence in the photos. Okay. So who came up with this engine, like the company? So this engine was originally developed by Wright, mm -hmm. um, and, and the two big ra uh, air-cooled radial engine manufacturers were Pratt & Whitney and Wright. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, during the war, we had a need for these by the thousands. So they were also produced by subcontractors. Studebaker is probably the most famous one uh, that it was uh, subcontracted to produce this engine. And the Memphis Bell did have Studebaker produced Wright engines, but also Wright produced engines. Mm -hmm. um, it's not very well known, but the, the Memphis Bell actually went through several engines during its tour. Either they needed to be overhauled or they were damaged. So for instance, on the Memphis Bell's second mission mm -hmm. on the 9th of November, they went in at 10,000 feet to try and bomb at low altitude. They were trying something different. The 8th Air Force leaders, airplanes got shot up pretty badly. Yeah. In the case of the Bell, their number one engine got hit pretty badly by flak, had to be replaced. Wow. An essential part of the conduct of the Army Air Force's daytime strategic bombing campaign was getting the bombers to high altitude. Now, they were still vulnerable to flak and to German fighters to some degree and still took grievous losses, but if they had to fly at 15, 20,000 feet, it just wouldn't have been possible. And the enabling technology here is the turbo supercharger, um, and it's uh, supercharging the air. And basically what that means, it's compressing the air. And in the case of the B-17 and some other Army Air Force's aircraft, the air was actually compressed twice. It was first compressed with a turbo supercharger, and we see this system here. Mm -hmm. And then that went to the engine where it was supercharged. And, and here's basically how it works. The air comes in the leading edge and goes to the turbo supercharger. And we have the turbo supercharger here. So this air comes in and this is an impeller. It's basically a compressor. So that's compressing that air that's thin at high altitude to maintain the, the horsepower of the engine that otherwise would be lost. And what's remarkable about this system is, okay, what drives this impeller? On a turbo, on a turbo supercharger, that is driven by engine exhaust. So this is the turbine wheel, and the engine exhaust coming from off the engine was ducted to the turbine wheel. This spins the turbine wheel at about 21,000 RPM, which is on the same axle as the impeller. Mm. What's important here is other countries had superchargers. A supercharger spins an impeller, but it does it mechanically off the engine. So that takes away a little bit of power from the engine. Mm -hmm. The turbo supercharger is taking advantage of engine exhaust that comes off. It doesn't cost any horsepower. What's remarkable with the B-17 is this turbo supercharger, it's on every engine. There's all kinds of ducting. Uh, it's, it's a fairly complex system. It's turbo supercharged, but then that air goes to the engine and on the back of the engine is another is a supercharger that runs off the engine. So the air actually got compressed twice, which maintained the horsepower at high altitude, which really enabled the survivability and ultimately the viability of the daytime strategic bombing campaign. Wow. Um, and for those that are really new to this, why is it so important to have that compressed air out of the engine? Why can't it just run on ambient air? So, so I would say, um, you know, kind of a, a way to put it sort of in layman's terms is, you know, when we're at on a 10,000 foot mountain, we have to be able to breathe. And the higher we go, the air gets thinner and thinner. The engines have to have compressed air and have to get enough oxygen and have enough pressure. And 
turbo superchargers are very efficient in doing that. And there's a good reason why the B-17 had turbo superchargers. The uh, Air Force's labs in the late teens and early 20s were experimenting with turbo superchargers. This is right after World War I with uh, Sanford Moss and General Electric. In fact, using an early turbo supercharger, there was a test pilot who flew at 41,000 feet in the early 1920s, unbelievable. So America and the, and the Air Force had a lot of experience with turbo superchargers. And when we look in World War II, no other nation use turbo superchargers to a large degree on their combat aircraft. There were some specialized aircraft that the Luftwaffe had and some other air forces, but it's only the U.S. that had that on the B-17, B-24, P-47, and P-38. And it just gives a huge advantage at high altitude, allowing the horsepower to be maintained and not bleeding off um, power off the engine to run an impeller. That's incredible.